Our scripture reading this morning is from Acts chapter 7, verse 59 through chapter 8, verse 3. As they battered him with stones, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, accept my life. Falling to his knees, he shouted, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. Then he died. Saul was in full agreement with Stephen's murder. At that time, the church in Jerusalem began to be subjected to vicious harassment. Everyone except the apostles was scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Some pious men buried Stephen and deeply grieved over him. Saul began to wreak havoc against the church. Entering one house after another, he would drag off both men and women and throw them into prison. A hard word from scripture this morning as we look at who Paul was before he was Paul, as we look at that Saul. And to look at one of our heroes and ancestors of faith as approving um, and in full agreement with another's murder is a hard pill to swallow. And so we come to this day, and I want to loop us back with our study through Lent on the cycles of call in our soul. And, and we talked on Easter sun, Sunday last week about the headwaters, that very start, right, where the triangle is of the poison river, and it's just poison because this di- uh, divides the internal aspects of call from the public and external aspects, and that's a really hard point to cross and a shift to make. And it's both at the bottom where we talked about it in Lent when we go from internal revelation from God into risking putting that into practice in our lives in a way that others see it, in a way that it reorders our relationships and changes the way we live. And at that very top is the headwaters, is another time we cross the river. But unlike that bottom time we cross the river, sometimes we don't even realize when we've crossed a headwaters, when a moment has changed. And that's where we find ourselves in this story of Saul and Stephen's murder, the first martyr of the faith. He doesn't even realize that anything has changed or been different in in this crossing and living into who he feels that he is called to be. Yet everything has changed, and we as third-person omniscient invited into this story know what's about to happen, but he doesn't at this moment. And so we gather at these headwater moments in this Easter season because everything has changed. And we're about to see Paul and Saul's resistance. Um, And we know the resistance already of the disciples. The youth um, were able to portray that for us in the Easter sunrise service of the grief that happened of not believing that Jesus was alive and the women coming in to telling them and Luke lays it out even more so than the gospel according to John of the men not believing the women at all. And so there's resistance to hope again after hope has been so thoroughly obliterated and watching your leader and your hope die as Rome does what what Rome always did. And there's a lot of reclaiming that has to happen in digging back. And remember, we've got a whole journey on the road to Emmaus as Jesus goes back through all of the scriptures with those pilgrims on that road and helps them reclaim everything that was taught and to recenter themselves in, in that promise and in that understanding and interpretation of that word. And then we have revelation, right? We have Jesus himself showing up in their midst. And still we have some resistance, right, from Thomas because he wasn't there for the other pieces of this. And he's like, "Mm -mm, nope, nope, unless I am able to touch, no. But again, revelation comes. and, And in this moment, in being fed in this revelation, literally with the fish along the beach and the call to love the call to Peter to love Jesus and to feed Jesus' sheep, that poison river gets crossed. And all of a sudden, the disciples, instead of hovering and huddling in, in this room, scared, 
are going out and preaching and teaching and taking a risk on that they weren't willing to before that revelation, before their reclaiming of scripture and that what they believed was true really was true. And then comes a whole bunch of new relationships. And we'll celebrate that in fullness in Pentecost and the thousands that were added to their numbers. And we'll celebrate as we go through with Philip and the eunuch and others like Saul and Paul. And there's nothing like new relationships as a call goes when your enemy now becomes one of your greatest colleagues and champions. And that's the piece that I want to talk about today, is what we do in this call cycle and how we go through it again when the first time we had gone through it and understood our call, we're beginning to find out that we got that call wrong. Because we are human creatures who are finite, who see dimly as if in a mirror. We have not yet seen face to face. We do not know the full will of God. And so as good as our intentions are, as much as we strive and try to know what God's will is, there are times we're going to get it wrong. And so how do we build the courage to follow Saul and Paul's example, to pray the prayer that we did with the kids of going to God and saying when we got it wrong and asking to find a new path. These kinds of calls are the absolute hardest and the most complicated and the most powerful. And so we come to this moment to look at how our entire faith is based on one of these calls and one of these moments of a follower of Christ who is willing to go through this cycle again, admitting that he had gotten it wrong and using that testimony and using that mistake and putting it into God's love to become even more powerful for transformation and to open up the relating to a whole entire new group of people, the Gentiles, which brings us here thousands of years later into this very room, sharing this faith and this moment together today. Now, before we go any further, I do want to um, take a moment for a point of order, <laughs> if you would, um, in remembering that what we are talking about now in scripture in this moment is is our Jewish um, brothers and sisters. Everyone is Jewish in this moment. Jesus is Jewish. Paul, Saul is Jewish. The followers are Jewish. Everyone is Jewish. There is no Christianity. And I want to make that clear because of the anti-Semitism that is developed and the violence that has come um, from passages such as this um, in interpreting them in a wrong way. We are here today to talk about how we do no harm and how we do no harm in reflecting on, on our actions and what we're doing because we are still able as human beings, here's the terrible kicker, we're still able to do harm even when we don't mean to do harm or don't intend to do harm. And, and so in this very sermon, there's a danger of the example that we're using to do harm while we're talking about not doing harm. And right, these are complicated matters, but they're important to go into that complicated tangle um, so that we can give God the most room to work with and the Holy Spirit the most room to work with so that when we give ourselves and follow call, we are doing all the good we can and we are not, in fact, doing more harm while we are intending to do good and to share good news. And so we come back to Saul and to everyone being Jewish and remember the context Remember that we are, are under, as Jews in this time, everyone is under Roman occupation. Everyone is trying to figure out how to live a core identity of themselves and of who they are in a space and a time and in a power structure that does not allow for that. And so just like the church now, we're all going to agree on needing to keep that identity and hold fast to it, and we're not at all going to agree on the ways to do that. 
And that has not changed over the thousands of years that we've all been had of, of all of us trying to live out our faith in the most faithful way possible. And so we encounter this story, and um, Saul has chosen to take the point of eradicating the followers of Christ and stomping out that movement because it's threatening the balance that the Jews have been able to carve out under Roman Empire. And if this gets too far out of control, right, like, because we all like to have a semblance of control and know where things are and have that security, then who knows what could happen? And so we got, we got to take that out. We got to take that factor and that, and that um, possibility out of the equation. And so that's Saul's response. And for others, um, for the other apostles and disciples, that very following of Christ and his teaching give a whole new possibility and a new hope of regaining self and power and purpose under occupation that they never had before. So this is a really, really hard tangle. And what I want us to take from this is how thoroughly each lived out what they believed. Because where we need to give Saul all the props is that he believed something and he lived that belief. He fully integrated it into all his life. And that is something that we want, all of us, that full integration of what we say we believe and how we live what we say we believe. And yet, Harm can still be done even when we think we are following a call from God and protecting our faith and protecting our people and community. And this is where self-reflection comes in. This is why our founder, John Wesley, said that scripture wasn't just enough, that we needed to plumb the depths of scripture with the tradition of the church, with all the um, reflection that our ancestors of faith have brought to us, with our own personal reflection from our own experiences, and with our reason. And so how is what we are doing affecting others? And we're going to look at Paul's version of that next Sunday as, as that moment of reclaiming and the soul cycle starts, of stopping and seeing. Because at some point, if you are trying to protect your people and your faith, by dragging them from their homes and imprisoning them on top of a prison that everyone is already living under Roman occupation, that's not exactly going to be the help um, that, that we want and we are trying to get to. And so this Sunday is the call to examine our call, to examine how we are living our beliefs, to examine how that living is affecting those around us, and to hear where there might be a new call in that either to strengthen and to continue our perseverance or to change course. And what I love from this story, from this foundational story of our faith and who the church is, is one of our core ancestors modeling how not to be afraid to say, I got it wrong. How to not be afraid to change all of who we have understood ourselves to be, all of how we have built relationships in the world, all of how we have determined our purpose, our direction, and how we will live out our lives, how not to be afraid to say, I really thought that I was in line with God's will, and I have taken the chance of the personal and the spiritual experiences that have come my way to reevaluate that and to change accordingly. In my work, in my own faith journey, in my work as a pastor, there is no greater gift to the church. There is no greater gift in showing the strength of faith than these moments of being willing to say, I got it wrong, and to try again. Because I think this is our Easter upside-down miracle of death being turned to life. 
I think this is the moment that all of culture and all of the water we swim in gets a say, wait, what just happened? You're not devastated by failure. It's not ruined you. It's not made you question and despair all of who you are and feel like you're something to be thrown out. It's actually done exactly the opposite and given you a strength that we've never seen in you yet, given you a life and a purpose we've never experienced in you yet. If there's anything that our world needs, it is a message that failure isn't the end. It doesn't mean that we're worthless human beings. It means that we're trying. It means that we're trying to do something that is beyond ourselves. It means that we're giving ourselves into the fullness of life. It means that we're brave. And for all the evils and all of the spiritual forces of wickedness that we will be up against, if we don't give ourselves permission to try and to fail, then we will contain ourselves so tightly that we will give up all our power. This is a weird example to share, but if you take gnats and you contain them, at very first, they're gonna pop against the edges of that container and trying, and then slowly they're gonna learn that space and they're gonna stay in that space even when you take the container off. They won't go any farther. May this not be the example and the metaphor of our faith. May we try, may we fail, and may we try again because we serve a risen Christ who has conquered even death. And if Christ can conquer death, then Christ can conquer us getting it wrong and work through us, in us, with us, and in spite of us all the more to bring forth and establish a resurrection kingdom on this earth. So we're gonna journey with Saul and we're going to journey with Saul through him claiming how he got it wrong, through him claiming a new call and all of the resurrection life that God was able to work from that because of this beginning, because of this headwater crossing. May it be so for us and for the church yet today. Amen. <laughs>